Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Advanced Topics. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about copy elision, and more specifically, the return value optimization and named return value optimization. Now, both of these have to deal with the return of an object from a function. All right, so on that return, if we end up doing a copy of that object, it could be very expensive if the, if the object is very large. So we want to try to avoid that or elide that copy. So let's look at some situations where we do the compiler helps us out and gets rid of that copy for us, and some situations where the compiler is not able to. So we'll go ahead and start uh, by creating this object that we're going to return. So we'll make a struct called s. And we'll go ahead and put an array in S, right? So we'll call, we'll make an int array uh, called data, and let's give it say four elements here. And then uh, that'll be it for our object. And let's write a function that returns something of type S. So we'll go ahead and return or have uh, S get S here, and it will go ahead and just return um, an unnamed temporary here. So we'll just return um, S being constructed, right? And that'll be initialized to zero. So what do we see inside of our assembly? So we'll be doing this on Compiler Explorer. Um, so here we see that EAX gets set to zero and EDX gets set to zero. So what does this actually mean in the context of our code? Well, our int array is only four integers, right? And our EAX and EDX registers are 64 bits. So each of these registers can hold two integers, right? Because an integer is 32 bits each. So here, um, basically our return values are being stored in EAX and EDX, or the entire array. And that's how they're being returned um, to the call site or whoever's calling this function. Okay, so we have something that's small, it just gets returned through a register. There's no copy going on here. Okay, so let's see something a little bit fancier. Let's go ahead and say, um, let's go ahead and put a six here, right? So let's go ahead and increase the size of our array. And we see something significantly different now. So now, you know, our data array doesn't fit inside of a register anymore or those two registers. So it ends up being stored, right, in what looks like this pointer RDI right here. So we're storing zero into the base of RDI, and then two integers away or eight bytes away. We're storing another zero, and then 16 bytes away, another zero. So this is basically initializing our six integers to zero here. But what exactly is RDI here? So you basically have this kind of hidden argument that gets passed to your um, function, and that is a pointer to this thing known as the return slot. So um, the return slot is basically where the caller has reserved some, uh, some space to store the return value. So here you see we're constructing the object, so we're initializing these six data elements directly inside of the return slot, right? So there's no copy going on here. Normally what we'd expect, right, if we create an object inside of a function, right, we call a constructor, the object gets created, and then, you know, when that you know, object goes out of scope, um, we end up destructing that object. But in this case, we're just creating the object inside of the return slot. And that was allocated by the, that was allocated by the caller, right? So now we've just created something, right, that will be used directly by the caller. We didn't have to do a copy into the return slot. Um, we just created the object directly in the return slot. So this is an example of what's known as RVO, right? RVO deals with the return of unnamed temporaries here. And since C++ 17, we're actually guaranteed to have return value optimization here, even if we get rid of, say, any optimizations, right? You see that we still don't have any copies going on here. We're just loading RDI into um, RBP minus eight. And then you see uh, we're loading RBP minus eight into REX here. Um, so REX is essentially RDI and you see we're loading everything into RDI here. So even in unoptimized code, we're getting the return value optimization. Okay, so let's turn uh, dash O back on. So this is RVO. So what is named RVO, right? So named RVO was very similar. So here we'll just create, uh, in this case, we'll create an object with a name. So we'll create say S1 here in the exact same fashion, right? zero initialized. And then now we'll return S1 now. So you see we get the exact same thing going on here, right? So even if we create this object seemingly in this function, it gets created inside of the return slot here. So in RVO or named RVO deals with the return of named temporaries inside of a function. Okay, so this is this is great. We get to see that we're, we're not having a copy. We're not creating an array of data elements and then copying that array of data elements into the return slot. What about when RVO doesn't work or when we don't get copy elision? So let's go ahead and change this up slightly. Let's pass a condition into our function. 
we'll go ahead and create another uh, struct here. And then let's go ahead and return one of these structs based on the condition. So we'll return based upon the condition either S1 or S2 here. So what happens to our code? Well, let's kind of go line by line here. So these three lines, you see we're creating S1 on the stack here. So if you can see with the color highlighting, you know, the colors denote, you know, you know roughly which uh, lines of assembly uh, match to the lines of the source code. So here you see that we're going ahead and we're creating S1 on the stack. Then we're going ahead and we're creating S2 on the stack here, right? And then you see we've got a couple other things going on that relate to this return condition, right? So we go ahead and get the value for both S1 and S2 here. So this is getting the value of S2. This is getting the, or basically a pointer to S1. So this is load effective address. So if we go ahead and hover over it, you see it computes the effective address of the second operand. So of RSP minus 64 and of RSP minus 32 and stores them in RCX and RDX respectively. And then we have a test going on here on R um, or on ESI. ESI is just a, a register that's used for passing in uh, parameters to a function. So here you see we've got ESI here, and this is just going to be our condition we're passing in. So based upon doing a logical and of this condition, you know, basically just figuring out if it's zero or non-zero, um, we end up doing this C move, right? So C move uses the result of this test. So C move, right, is a conditional move. So just like we can have conditional branches like jump if equal, jump not equal, we can have moves that are also conditional. So here you see we're conditionally moving RCX into RDX here. So basically what's going on is we're deciding whether to um, return S1 or S2 here because RCX and RDX hold the two pointers, right? Pointers to either S1 or S2. And so we're either moving RCX, which points to S2 into RDX, or we're leaving RDX as is, as it currently holds S1 or the pointer to S1 or the address of S1. Okay, so after we've done all this, this is basically our condition out of the way. Now we get to do the final part, which is, you know, basically returning from the function. But it looks significantly different than it did last time. So now we're loading whatever stored at RDX into a vector register. This XMMO is a 128-bit register. So we're loading four of our integers into XMMO, and then we're loading XMMO into RDI, the return slot. Then you see we're loading in the last two integers, right, being stored in RDX, into RDX now. And then we're storing um, RDX into RDI plus 16, basically the last two places inside of the return slot here, right? So this is the last two integers of our six integer array, and this XMMO is the first four integers. Okay, so what is going on here? We're not getting copulation, right? How can I tell we're not getting copulation? Because we're creating an object, and then down here, we're copying the object into the return slot, right? So now we have basically two versions, and we're paying the price of this big copy here, right? And if I go ahead and, you know, if I increase the size of this, right, you see we're still going to have these copies into the return slot. It's only going to get worse and worse and worse as this, you know, the amount of data we have in this struct gets larger, right? So that's why we should really understand about um, the return value optimization, when we can get the return value optimization and when we can't, or the named return value optimization. So uh, in this case, right, we're talking about the uh, we can't get it because it's based on this condition, right? We don't know whether or not we're returning S1 or S2 because we don't know which one we're going to return. We can't construct one of them in the return slot because it might be the wrong one. So the compiler has to pull back, be conservative, and uh, and end up just saying, okay, you'll have to end up copying it into the return slot. All right, so that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. That's a brief introduction to the return value optimization. I'll link a great talk below from CppCon 2018 from Arthur O'Dwyer that goes more into the cases where you won't get, um, say, copy elision or the return value optimization and you know what basically the standard says about um, the return value optimization. But that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. As always, you can check out any of the any of the code that I write um, and any for any of my series on GitHub.com slash Coffee Before Arch. And as always, uh, you can ask me any questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, and as always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.